Bueno, pues, bueno, pues nada. Eh, ok. So, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on the place you're in, depending on the continent in which you are. First of all, I'd like to thank the, the audience who are now following this meeting, this webinar, the seminar. And I'd like to tell you that we have interpretation into English, French, and Spanish. And if you have any questions, if you want to address any questions to the speakers, please do that through the chat. I'm going to start by first thanking our Brussels office. They have been in charge of organizing this seminar for the party of the European left. And before anything else, I'd like to thank the interpreters who are always working in difficult conditions right now because we do not send uh, speeches, myself included, I haven't done it, so I have nothing to say about the other speakers. But I'd like to deeply thank the two people who are with us today, these uh, great political leaders who are our speakers for today and who will this will be a discussion we will we'll be talking and discussing and i will now introduce them before that very briefly i'd like to explain why we decided to set up the seminar and why we thought that uh, within the seminar for young people linked or around the party of the european left this debate was relevant we reflected upon what kind of international discussion we wanted to have we have so many topics we can speak about palestine we can speak about the middle east the sahara peru colombia we have so many different topics i think that unfortunately i'd say that we have uh, lots of burning questions internationally they of course thrilling and we have to discuss them but we decided to reflect upon this and uh, think about whether everybody or at least everybody in the left was against the Cuba blockade and sanctions to Venezuela whether we really understand and I include myself here what that actually means whether we truly understand the meaning for the people for example, the people of Cuba have been subjected to sanctions for 70 years, or to an embargo, to a blockade. And what happens in Venezuela with the sanction policy? So we were thinking about that and we realized that it was truly important that we could understand that the sanctions or blockade or embargo is, of course, uh, targeting governments, or that is the goal but it also goes against uh, the people against ordinary citizens against women against children against workers in general against everyone in these pandemic times we thought that we that this was particularly important but it, it is particularly important to understand what uh, an embargo and sanctions mean during a humanitarian crisis such as the one we're in right now so without any further ado, I'd just like to add um, a comment I think that is really shameful for the people of the world that on Thursday, the 24th, they passed, 183 countries passed a no to the embargo, to the Cuba embargo, and two voted for the US is one of them, who's the guardian, and Israel, three, um cast a blank votes and nothing else was done so once again this is for you to understand why and then when you listen to our speakers you will understand even better why we decided to organize the seminar today let me first introduce carolis elena perez gonzalez carolis is a revolutionary militant and a political leader venezuelan political leader who is, of course, um, very courageous because we know what it means to be black, to be a woman, and a series of 
elements that are difficult for any for anybody in any country in the world. She has, from the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution, she has held different positions in building socialism in the 21st century. And right now, she's leading, nonetheless, in, uh, the, the Ministry of Women and Gender Equality. She is a feminist and she's working for women and gender equality, but she's also responsible for something else. I'm sure she will explain this later, which is the mission homes of the motherland, given protection and social security to Venezuelan families. Secondly, we have, because we have to organize this and well, we put women first during our presentations and introductions. So secondly, we have my dear friend Enrique Uvieta Gomez, is a writer, a nonfiction writer, and he's from Cuba, and he's the editor of Cuba Socialista. I'd like to add as well that Enrique was in Italy, in Lombardia, with the brigade. And then if Enrique has a couple of minutes, then he can explain what the Henry Brigade is, because sometimes they're discussing that the, this brigade is going to be given the Nobel Peace Prize, but nobody understands what the brigade is. And I'd like to add as well that Enrique just published a few weeks ago the book Chronicles from Turin. And this uh, explains how they fought against the pandemic from a country subjected to an embargo. And this is from the human perspective of Enrique Vieta. So first, I would like to give the floor to Carolis. Carolis, you have 20 minutes. After that, we'll have Enrique. He will have 20 minutes as well. And then we will open the Q&A session. And thank you very much for your presence. Carolis, you have the floor now. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon on your side. Good morning on our side. On behalf of the president, Nicolás Maduro Moro, the president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and on behalf of the, of the team who work constructing Bolivarian and feminist socialism in a wonderful land, I send you my greetings. I'd also like to thank the whole team, Maite and her colleagues who have invited us to be here today and share this extraordinary uh, space. All the more when we are all activists and political activists. And um, as one myself, I was seeing how ourselves uh, get invited to study the history, but sometimes we forget what other countries and peoples are living in the same historical moment in which we are living. That's why I'm so grateful, I'm particularly grateful that this seminar that is targeting young people around the European left has uh, invited us. And I'd like to greet Enrique Uvieta. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here because I'm a great admirer of his work. So it's a great pleasure to be in this seminar. Now, coming back to the invitation and the topic we're supposed to discuss, we're here to discuss, which is the embargo against Venezuela and sanctions, as they're usually called. We need to understand them in the framework of an imperialist policy that is constantly attacking the Bolivarian revolution. And there has been a, a, an escalation after the physical well, the, the passing away of our commander Chavez. And we all consider but after that, this is when the government of Barack Obama back in the day declares Venezuela an unusual and extraordinary threat for the safety of the US. In this sense, I'd like to say that Venezuela has the biggest oil reserves in the world. And it is amongst the five, the 10 top nations with the highest gas reserves in the world. 
and being located in a privileged geostrategical uh, situation is not that or that that uh, makes Venezuela a threat. It is the project that is contained in the constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. This is a constitution that I have to remind you all that it was written and it was passed during a national constitutional assembly after Commander uh, Chavez was elected in 98 when he became the president of the Republic in 1999. It was then, and that was his first decree, he called for a constitutional assembly to re-found uh, the Republic. And this is how this constitutional text came about. And this is how this becomes the project of a nation uh, that was approved by uh, the majority of the population. And this is how we became a threat we all know, we're all familiar with the experience, with the heroic experience of the Cuban, Cuban people and the Cuban revolution. And I'd like to show my solidarity at this point with the Cuban people. With the new imperial attack, when after the, the vote in the United Nations to lift the embargo. But the social project included in our constitution, which has been already um, in practice in 20 years has led us to become a threat because we've shown that it is possible to build a different type of society with a different type of government and as ideological principles dictate and we can remind them here it was um, said by Simon Bolivar a liberator the human being can become the center and human beings can achieve as highest level of happiness and as highest level of social justice. This is what the text here shows. It actually summarizes the thinking of Simon Bolivar, which underlies a revolution. We also have to consider, and this is just something for you to, to think about briefly so that we can have the proper context and assessment of the coercive unilateral measures pushed by the imperial government. We all need to remember that in Venezuela, women are 51% of the population. Our population is right now undergoing a census, but we think that it is around 32 million inhabitants. Therefore, when Venezuela is um, declared a threat in 2014, 2015, on the 9th of March of that year of 2015, we see that what had been happening before since 2014 crystallizes in Obama's government. Since 2014 until today in 2021, the North American government, the government of the US, has promoted two acts, seven decrees, and 300 administrative measures to sanction, as it's usually referred to or misnamed, the government of the Bolivarian uh, Republic. We're speaking about sanctions as a euphemism to describe internationally what is definitely a set of coercive unilateral measures and the criminal blockade that has an impact on the population as a whole. To that, we have to add the reality of COVID-19. Indeed, the Venezuelan people has been struggling and fighting as no other people against a reality that has turned quite hostile. We technically call those unilateral coercive measures, even if the public opinion from that same international media are presented as sanctions. The people recognize this as a blockade, as an embargo. I, just, I would just like to spend a few minutes speaking about technical aspects. My dear, dear colleagues, the Charter of the United Nations does not recognize sanctions. That's why the international media wants to use this term. The Charter of the United Nations in Article 41 states 
that the Council, the Security Council, invites or might invite member states to introduce measures that do not involve using um, military force to maintain or restore peace at international level. And it also highlights that economic world sanctions and commercial embargoes, integrated commercial embargoes, are now today coercive, obsolete coercive measures. And we want to stop here because we want to claim that these measures are openly a violation of human rights. Until now, the US has been supported by other countries such as Canada, the European Union, the so-called Lima Group, the financial system and different organ international organizations and companies and suppliers of goods and services who have joined this operation, this blockade operation and this sanctions to our country. This has affected the affected debt, the sovereign debt, and the debt of the most basic industry for economic system, that is the oil industry. It has affected the reserves of the Venezuelan Central Bank. Our gold has been stolen and it's kidnapped by international banks. It has also affected the commercialization of petrol, of, uh, of oil, of gold, access to food and medicines, raw materials, equipment, transport. It has also affected companies who want to negotiate and who want to engage in trade openly with the government of Venezuela. Several vessels and planes of our national industry have been have been sanctioned and even individuals might I have to say that for me this is like uh, it's a medal for me it's a merit but I have been sanctioned myself along with other people by the US government and we had to fight and understand what it means uh, in the media this is not so much for us we're all men and women who are used to this kind of struggle but we have to think about our, our families and uh, people around us the use of an embargo as a political tool as a tool is a fact that uh, has been used um, by imperial powers to stop those governments that are uncomfortable for them and i'm sure that enrique's presence will help us see and understand how after such a long time, a nation such as Cuba is still standing in the midst of such hostility. We also have to say that the embargo and sanctions, those unilateral coercive measures have not only been uh, an isolated measure, they have also been accompanied by other actions, fascist actions within our country mainly supported and pushed by an organization called Voluntad Popular, whose leader in 2014, and some say that until today, uh, has fled justice and he is in Spain, Mr. Leopoldo Lopez. We also have to highlight that these actions, we call them Guarimba, this um, small street action uh, that mm, block the streets and affect um, movement in the cities. And unfortunately, they have left 150 people casualties in these years due to political street action. And we have also seen the introduction of an aspect that was not uh, familiar for us, which is fascism. In this part of Latin America, we do not have a tradition of combating fascism as it has been the case for many European nations. What we've seen is that there's now a fascist generation in our country. And one of the most important arguments that we've heard to push this kind of methods has to do with the fact that it doesn't have an impact on the population as a whole. It strictly addresses individuals who are in the government and that is not true. The unilateral coercive measures and the embargo has an impact on the population as a whole, regardless of the, your political party, sexual orientation, and it has an impact 
that can be seen in the fact that whether somebody is better off or, or worse off. So it has an impact on ordinary citizens, on the people as a whole, that has been at the core of our revolutionary policies. We have to remember that this, it was precisely the Bolivarian Revolution that managed to um, comply, uh, that, that led our country to fulfill all of the uh, development goals, Millennium Development Goals, which had an impact on 191 uh, public civil servants uh, and their families. The fam our families are also sanctioned, 20 nationals, two na Venezuelan companies, 11 Venezuelan uh, state companies, 71 foreign companies, 15, um, 15 planes, several others from the state airline and several vessels as well. As you were saying, in any case, we are also, they're also trying to disguise the impact of these measures in the world media, calling this a humanitarian crisis. This is another tool that has been used from a media perspective to describe the impact of these measures that were generated by those governments themselves who handle the international media to justify other aggressions and other types of invasions through the creation of organizations from the net in the US. These organizations are funded to undertake a specific action in a territory and they use the term humanitarian crisis to intervene in other right-wing governments in a uh, con in our continent have tried to intervene. And also with our friends from Colombia, we have 1,200 kilometers of common border, and we've seen attempts uh, to attack, military attack a territory, so that they, they push us out by force. They couldn't push us out through the votes, and they're trying through those means. And this is the government of the president, Nicolas Maduro, and it's the government of the Bolivarian Revolution. In the face of all this, I won't, uh, I won't uh, be speaking for much longer, but I think that we need to investigate all this. The socioeconomic indicators of Venezuela in 2013, before the beginning of this set of coercive unilateral measures and before the embargo, have to be analyzed to see the growth of social protection, which is evident, and the impact of uh, Bolivarian uh, revolutionary measures on the population. With these measures, they are trying to uh, finish off this model. I'll just share some data from 2003 until 2013. The Venezuelan economy grew for 22 uh, consecutive quarters. The forecasts of the PAL, of the International Monetary Fund and other agents for 2014 uh, forecasted a growth of 1% or even higher. And from then on, that's when they introduced the measures that had an impact on our economy. We have to say that, the G, that our GDP went down 63.4% only in 2014. And between 2014 and 2019, we have tried to bring it back up and trying to introduce different ways of living together and facing the impact of these measures. And now I have to speak about our daily life. There's an estimate of five million, from $5.5 million are retained or frozen in 50 international banks. What does this mean? This means, and it translates in the difficulty to access drugs and especially highly high value drugs that were previously freely distributed through a public health system in a country and we estimate that until 2019 40,000 people have died in our country due to lack of access to medicines that are basically uh, available for HIV patients, for diabetic patients, hypertense patients, uh, people who are suffering from cancer. And we've seen the impact in women and in particular in our country. This has led us to establish other mechanisms 
that will help us have access to those drugs. And they have also been blocked recently. Our Vice President of the Republic, Dr. Tess Rodriguez Gomez, already claimed that there was a blockade of the payment that we did through the COVAX mechanism to acquire vaccines. And despite that, we wanted to make progress in this process. The possibility of importing foodstuffs was also blocked and the possibility to import and uh, trade with oil, the oil industry, and whoever comes here will see it when the long queues we have at petrol stations. Remember that Venezuela never had this kind of shortage, never before, and today we do have to queue for this. However, what has happened in recent years, this has allowed us to design and rethink our public policies and how we do politics and we exercise government in an embargoed country. We had to rethink our narrative because we think that there are ironies still being used at the international, uh, in the international field. We see, for example, a uh, situation that uh, has to do with violence against women is uh, seen in, the, in many organizations. We hear about violations of women's rights, but not how the embargo is one of them, because we see that this, these measures have an impact on daily life, and it is precisely women who have uh, suffered the impact of this embargo. Of the 6.2 million households we're protecting in our country, around 80% of them are women-led homes or households. This is a fact and a reality in our country. When the embargo started, there's long queues uh, to get food uh, to forced women to leave other activities in their lives. And we've heard that women were the first who lost their employment and their livelihood in this battle. Apart from that, this was also, we're still studying it, and we have studied it, you and me, the feminization of poverty and how the daily lives at home were uh, impacted by the embargo. And that's why we had to rethink the structure of a popular power. And that's how the supply and production local committees were created. These are structures within the communities that guarantee the effective distribution of foodstuffs and that are produced and imported by the government. Local committees are very active. And that's a structure that is led by 69.9% by women again. I hope you can see how I'm talking about a structure that is uh, designed uh, to combat uh, poverty. Let me just tell you th as well that uh, because of lower income in the households, you end up with tension and stress at home and uh, gendered violence, violence against women and uh, stress in relationships uh, has been growing. As a result of that, uh, we launched uh, six years ago, Homes in Our Homeland, a plan with a system whereby the Venezuelan government gives a bonus, uh, an added amount of money uh, to wages depending on the structure of every particular household for instance if a home has a pregnant woman or dependents uh, older people children and the socialist basis program was launched as well so that we could le reach out uh, to the poorest areas of the country those are physical facilities and organizations so that together with popular associations and organizations, the policies uh, can be geared towards those that need it most. As a result of that, uh, we've 
got a specific plan uh, for women to help them with their delivery, with their breastfeeding. Those women who are pregnant or who are breastfeeding uh, can benefit from this program. We now have 17,000 uh, people who promote a uh, humane delivery so that uh, babies uh, and mothers can be given support uh, for the first 1,000 days of the baby's life. And as I said, uh, targeted and geared uh, to those who need it most. During this process, we've also revisited uh, the, uh, the way we can help with farming, for instance, uh, we've seen that many families have gone back uh, to rural areas uh, to grow their own vegetables and have their own farm animals uh, for the household. Very often, uh, this program is led again by women and uh, we've been helping uh, local community-based organizations. It's family production that's promoted uh, by this program that's led by the Bolivarian government. I'm also president of the uh, Women's Development Bank, and we've done a lot uh, for microcredits, uh, very much backed by our president as well, where over 10,000 women have benefited from that program, sexual rights, uh, have uh, been on our agenda as well, connected with the access to contraceptives or sexually transmitted diseases that need certain medication as well. Because for us to uh, fully uh, exercise our sexual uh, liberties, uh, we feel that's very much affected as well by the embargo and the blockade. We find that uh, access to, how should I call it? Well, I guess it would be what either nationally or internationally, what SMEs are allowed to do in our country. Uh, the SMEs are very much curtailed. There is uh, more and more market share taken by the larger companies, uh, which doesn't does a lot of harm for the emancipation of women. Dear comrades, I can tell you, even access to education and training uh, has been diminished by the unilateral coercive measures. We were doing so well, for instance, with scholarships uh, given uh, to young Venezuelan students to go and study abroad. Those programs uh, were very badly harmed. We couldn't uh, give those scholarships anymore. The program had to stop. And there was a huge campaign as well, a mass campaign telling our youth that there was no future for them in their country. And that's what uh, in our continent uh, we hear about all the time, about young Venezuelan migrants and even NGOs and some uh, governments from neighboring countries uh, are launching programs to give aid to this terrible uh, exodus of young people, uh, this brain drain from our country. And I know I'm not doing great for time, but let me just close, dear Maite telling you that in our country, we've got some 6 million Colombians who live here with us because of the in civil war, internal civil war that they've had for decades in their country. The European Union seems to forget that uh, our country welcomed uh, all those migrants who came after the Second World War and uh, for other reasons. All those people who came to live here with us, 
with no hostility, no xenophobia on our part. For people who talk about uh, Venezuelan migration as uh, an evil in their countries, they seem to forget that in our homeland for the last few months, we've been promoting a specific policy to bring back Venezuelan migrants who found the doors were closed to them uh, in other countries as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm, I'm referring to the uh, Come Back to Your Homeland uh, program that has helped 5,000 Venezuelans come back home. So these unilateral coercive uh, measures are total violation of human rights. And we clearly say that we are still very much aware what our role should be in the struggle against imperialism, that uh, our project uh, described by our constitution is the project that draws a horizon of full development for Venezuelan people uh, in this Bolivarian feminist uh, socialism we have in our country. Let me just uh, open an idea for uh, the Q&A session later on. We are now in the post-COVID society. I don't know what uh, our dear Enrique would think about this. Well, uh, we used to he call the working class to organize and build socialism in the past. Well, now in the post-pandemic society, I would say the main historical subject uh, are women. We are called to organize and build the type of socialism that uh, will help us transform the human race. Not just any woman, it's women who are aware of their homeland. We identify imperialism as our main enemy. I'm talking about uh, women who are aware they class they belong to because it's in socialism where women can develop and uh, be independent. But that's not going to happen uh, automatically just like that. We should do it. Women who are gender aware and the 21st century socialism, as Commander, Commander Chavez said, is a feminist socialism. Women who are also aware of the relevance of ethnicity, being proud of our roots, whether it's indigenous roots or Afro roots, uh, whatever ethnic group, because that's why we are what we are. So for all of you, dear young people, dear comrades, as uh, Commander Chavez said, and as uh, Aristóteles Studies said as well, hail the revolution and the free people in the world. We will win, Maite. I give you my word as a woman. Very true. We will win. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Before I hand the floor to Enrique, I would like to ask you to please send us uh, your uh, presentation. I believe that you have it in writing. We would love to have it translated uh, so that it can be read by as many people as possible. Please bear with us uh, for the Q&A session later. And now, Enrique, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Maite. Uh, you can hear me OK, I hope. Please give me the OK. Great. Let me just start uh, by telling you how very happy, how proud I am to be here with uh, our dear Carolis and Maite. Being here with the youth of the European left, that's a real privilege for me because uh, they will be the ones and they are the ones who are playing a fundamental role, not just uh, in Europe, but uh, in the human race uh, because of their role in the fate and destiny uh, for all the peoples. I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, the embargo and blockade in Cuba, uh, which is a long story, but I'll try and cut it short. 
I would say that uh, facts and figures are important, and our Chancellor uh, presented a report uh, which is around 100 pages long with facts and figures uh, which feel a little bit abstract to me. They are important, true, but at the end of the day, what really matters is the people uh, behind those facts and figures. For those of us who were born in the, at the time when the embargo was being uh, paved, uh, that's all I know about. Uh, all I know about is the shortage and suffering that this uh, economic, financial and political embargo and blockade has meant for us. And it's part of a, a more overarching plan. It's a war plan against our country because uh, we took the path for independence. We were a colony subordinated to the United States. Over 50% of farmland in our country were in the hands of foreign companies and more particularly uh, America, uh, American country companies from the United States, we took the major step, which was nationalizing that farmland and of many industries. For instance, the sugar mills uh, were in the hands of the United States as well. Our idea at the time was uh, paying uh, those uh, who uh, had the companies taken away from them, but that was rejected at the time. Why? because uh, the landowners, large landowners were emigrating and leaving uh, Cuba, uh, thinking that this would be a very short lived government, that they wouldn't be there for long. They never imagined uh, that would then be official for how long, and they didn't want to uh, accept the compensations they were offered. And uh, we have to remember that uh, what was done uh, is a right, a sovereign right that every country has. It was all to do with vested economic interests in a geopolitical definition in a world where anybody that does what we did in their backyard is then labeled as a uh, an attack against the United States. That's what was said about Cuba, for instance, in the, at the time, secret memorandum, and I would like to read this. April the 6th, 1960. This was written by Lester Mallory, Mallory who was at the, the Vice Secretary for Inter-American Affairs, and he said, most Cubans support Castro. Well, there you have it. That's a clear acknowledgement that the government uh, that was there after the revolution was uh, backed uh, by the majority of the Cuban population. And in the foundations of democracy, that tells me that uh, that was a democratic popular government. Then he says, the only why that uh, we can think of uh, to uh, give them less internal support, uh, it would be if they have uh, sufficient material and economic difficulties. We need uh, to use all possible resources to weaken the economic life in Cuba. An action line that should be skillful and discreet. Well, it's not discreet anymore. I say an ad here. They uh, haven't done very well there. And uh, then we should deprive Cuba from money and supplies so that they have less financial resources and lower wages. Then it says we should cause hunger, desperation, and the oosting of the government. This was said by a subsecretary of state of the United States in 1960. Can you imagine? This was sent uh, to ambassadors um, of the US in countries all over the world, telling them how to act towards Cuba. Well, I'm as old as the revolution is, and in my generation, 
we had people who came from all over the country uh, who came to study uh, with a literacy campaign that was launched at the time and uh, i can tell you that uh, cuba uh, has done fantastically well uh, in education and training building our skills and capacity that uh, has over time then become uh, capacity uh, economic capacity raul castro uh, in the uh, party congress when we when he was retiring at the time he presented uh, the report at the start of the meeting he said the actions that uh, trump's government uh, has taken is not really about increasing the embargo and blockade in fact they now have new methods that uh, has made the war grow larger with shortage material shortage uh, that hurt every Cuban citizen. So we're talking about going up the ladder, uh, a more aggressive step on that ladder, because Trump's government uh, implemented 243 actions, coercive economic actions during, its, uh, during Trump's mandate. There were five uh, action packages in 2019, for instance, two uh, for surveillance and punishment of companies, uh, shipping companies, and so on, that would take oil, crude oil, to Cuba. This is something that we share with Venezuela, of course. Sanctions were given at that time to 27 companies, 54 ships, and a, a number of private individuals who, by the way, none of them were uh, from the United States. They acted like uh, pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, that's, that's what I can say. They find a ship at sea uh, bringing cr crude oil to Cuba. Uh, they stop it, uh, they uh, are then fined, they're, they're not allowed uh, to go into harbor for 180 days. And that's done uh, with complete impunity. Uh, I mean, where are uh, the boundaries there? So it's economic war, uh, plus uh, then a legal uh, war, and all of that created discontent if we can't have crude oil coming to Cuba because uh, the ships are stopped at sea or quite simply because we have to keep finding new suppliers new companies that can bring us the oil well you quickly see the international press saying that uh, the Cuban economy is undergoing terrible shortages and difficulties because the model doesn't work and uh, there will be outage uh, in Cuba. People will not have electricity at home uh, because the Cuban model doesn't work. I mean, that's, that's not the case, right? It's, it's such a, an irony or even cynical, I would say during the whole process uh, what they're doing is stop the cuban economy from developing as much as possible and proving supposedly that uh, the reason is that the country is inefficient we obviously have difficulties and problems everybody does and in any process uh, there are certain hiccups or certain barriers, uh, certain difficulties that need to be resolved uh, during the way. But we need to understand that the main difficulty uh, Cuba has uh, for development is the commercial and financial embargo and blockade. That's the main problem we our country is facing. Trump's government uh, is 
being violent and aggressive. And uh, then uh, the pandemic started, and that's an even more incredible situation. I suppose in the future, somebody will write about it. During the pandemic, at a time when so many people uh, are dying, that's the time when uh, Cuban medical brigades go and help all over the world. I'm talking about 54 medical brigades in 42 countries, in Asia, in Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, uh, which, by the way, I, I was uh, very lucky uh, to be with one of those brigades in Italy, in one of the G7 countries. And, and I can guarantee that uh, the Cuban government uh, was not getting paid at all, or uh, the Cuban uh, brigade members, uh, they didn't get paid for it. And we're talking about doctors and nurses uh, who went uh, to all these different countries and uh, the Cuban government paid for our expenses. I mean, we fortunately had somewhere to sleep and uh, we had three meals a day. That was covered for by the Cuban government uh, in a small country that is suffering from a, a very intense embargo, a, a terrible blockade. And even so, uh, a country that offers uh, their help, its help, to countries that are far richer without expecting anything in exchange. Why? Because of the real, authentic, revolutionary uh, mindset, uh, just like the Cuban revolution, because that's uh, what uh, we've been taught to do. Our doctors and nurses uh, faced at that time a terrible, were faced with a terrible paradox. In Cuba, uh, the number of doctors per capita is nine per 1,000 is one of the highest rates worldwide of doctors uh, per inhabitant. When the revolution started, there were about 3,000 doctors in Cuba. Now we have uh, around 90,000. Can you imagine the power of that? So the doctors we had uh, at the time when the revolution started had been taught uh, to work seeking uh, profit uh, which is completely different uh, with the mindset uh, that uh, doctors and nurses have right now so again let me go back to my example in the middle of the covid 19 crisis we were still stopped tried to stop us uh, from buying uh, ventilators, uh, diagnosed, di diagnostic kits, face masks, gloves. We were not allowed to buy them. And uh, fortunately, we've been investing for many, many years in research and development, in knowledge and know-how. And uh, Cuba is a country where we have been working for a long time for the common good, uh, not uh, with the aim in mind uh, that the benefit uh, should be for companies in a competing environment. Unfortunately, thanks to that, uh, we have been manufacturing our own ventilators, our diagnosis kits, with all of that, with Cuban techno technology, by the way in a situation where we had to reinvent the wheel and uh, do again something that had already been done by other countries, but we couldn't benefit from. Let me now just quickly refer to vaccines. What impact has embargo had on Cuban biotechnology, which has been developing uh, very, very significantly. In other medical areas, uh, we have uh, designed uh, our own vaccines for other pathologies, and I'm very lucky because my brother works for the uh, Genetic uh, Research Institute, which he was co-founder 
of. And I know what happens there. You might need a reagent for your piece of research, uh, which could be very easily done if you purchased it, purchased it in the in the United States, uh, just down the road. But you have to buy it from all over New Zealand uh, because we're we're not allowed to do that, uh, and it takes uh, much longer to get to us. Uh, it's more expensive, and there are times uh, when. Those processes are harder for us, uh, not just because they're geographically further away, but because you have to find them, find somebody who will do it for you, because otherwise they might be sanctioned by somebody. If, a, if any product uh, has at least 40% uh, share uh, in their ownership, which is American from the United States, we're not allowed to buy them. And uh, you can imagine the long list of uh, medications, drugs, uh, equipment that uh, are affected uh, by this. At a time uh, when uh, Big Pharma is global and when so many of uh, the big players uh, are partly owned by the United States, the same thing can be said about banking. We, we, we are banned from using American dollars, but at the same time, uh, banks uh, are banned uh, from working with us uh, because they would be sanctioned. I could give you such a long list of instances where, where very important players in the financial world uh, because they have accepted transfers of funding to Cuba, which is completely shameful. Uh, sometimes I'm talking about banks uh, that are based in the European Union and uh, countries that vote to help us uh, when they're sitting in the United Nations. But still, uh, they have uh, th those European banks uh, back the embargo and blockade. And I would like to tell you a little story now from when I was a child. I remember that uh, trams at that time in Cuba, uh, the uh, vehicles uh, were General Motors manufactured and over time uh, they they needed maintenance they needed spare parts and i remember uh, that when i was a teenager a teenager uh, public transport in this city uh, was uh, all the vehicles were replaced by british leyland vehicles we call them guagua here you probably know uh, for buses so I'm trying not to use the word I usually use here, which is the word guagua. So when we cut the bus, the guagua, we thought that the Leyland buses were the best, they were the newest thing, the hottest thing coming to Cuba. But an American transnational company bought Leyland and suddenly they stopped bringing buses of this brand and spare parts uh, for that for those brands into the country so what happens we had you know uh, buses from japan so they changed the whole public transportation system of a country overnight this sim seems like a simple thing but it is an example of our daily lives in cuba and I have left it myself in the course of my lifetime. We have uh, these Japanese uh, buses and we use them for our city lines. And suddenly they, oh, we could not uh, trade with Japan with these Japanese buses. So we had to change everything. And then we have the Icarus from Hungary until, of course, 
the socialist uh, area stopped existing and we stopped having all the spare parts again for those Hungarian buses. This is just an example of how our daily life is. And in our lifetime, we've seen, we've decided, we've seen the changes that have happened. Havana is famous because we see on the streets thousands of cars, North American cars of the 30s, 40s, and 50s of the 20th century. I remember that at some point, when Obama uh, re-established uh, the relationship, diplomatic relationship with Cuba, the Secretary of State went around Havana in one of those cars as if he was going back in time and as if he was showing how the, the, the country was paralyzed and how a 1950s car uh, from the US had remained active in a country whose economy was not operational. But in fact, the engine of this car could have been from the Soviet Union, Japanese. It could have had four parts from Hungary, four parts from Argentina. So inside, so the outside is a US car, but inside we have the imagination the resistant spirit of the Cuban people, the creativity of Cubans, they reassemble each space so that they can survive, so, and not just survive, but grow and continue developing. These are just two concrete examples. When we got to Italy, I'll give you another example. When we got to Italy, we had um, doctors who had been to different mission, missions abroad. We have to say that Cuban doctors had been, I, I also consider myself as a part of the brigade and sometimes I tend to include myself in it, but um, Cuban doctors had been in over 66 countries in the world and they are still in many countries, but they were usually present in those uh, countries that Bush Jr. used to call dark places, countries where there's poverty and uh, severe economic problems. It was the first time, it was almost the first time that a brigade as such of health relief, and I will explain what this means in a minute, was going to go to a first world country. The doctors arrived into an army hospital where we had a hundred beds, but on each bed, they had highly equipped elements, high tech um, equipment. And most likely in Cuba, we had a hundred devices because there were a hundred beds. And in big Cuban, in our big Cuban hospitals, we might have two, three machines, uh, pieces of equipment that we saw there. Why? Because the embargo prevents Cuba from purchasing those machines. And it prevents Cuba and Cubans that uh, from accessing those machines. So this has nothing to do with figures. It has to do with uh, making the lives of Cubans a bit easier, a bit more comfortable, a bit easier. So for example, what, what happens is that if a person is a prosthesis, they, instead of having the best one, the most adequate one, adequate one or the most comfortable one, or the most sophisticated one, they don't have it. Or if somebody is in a wheelchair, they do not have to be mechanically pushed by somebody, but they can have, they can be independent. The embargo also prevents, and this is still more severe, this is more difficult to add figures to it. It hinders saving lives because the drugs they're using is a replacement drug 
for the drug that's produced in the US and we do not have access to the drug that's produced in the US to save that life. And this can happen with an 80 year old person, but it can also happen to a five year old kid or younger. So we're speaking about an embargo blockade that whenever we quantify it, I'll go back to, I don't like figures very much, but sometimes we have to go back to them. Since April 2019 till March 2020, the losses are 5,570.3 million dollars. Those are the losses of the embargo to Cuba, just for the time period. I say that what the Americans, the business people in the US lost within nationalization has been um, repaid of, uh, by the Cuban people throughout the years with the money that we have stopped receiving and the, the hindrance to our development possibilities and the chances that we've prevented from having. And I think that we should have a proper balance between what we had to pay and they didn't want to pay. We wanted to pay, but they didn't want to accept our money back in the day because they thought that next week they would be back triumphantly and with their bags back. So the, now they are the ones who should be paying us for this campaign and for this permanent embargo that has become a sort of Holocaust, has become a sort of genocide for the Cuban people. What can we say about what's happened in recent times? The US government has less excuses for their embargo, and they use um, arguments that are unrelated arguments. For example, during Trump's government, Cuba was added again to the list of countries that are not fighting terrorism. This is absurd. Just a few days before that, a madman, to, of course he wasn't mad, he was completely in, in line with the powers, the counter-revolutionary counter powers in the US, came with an assault rifle to the Cuban embassy during the night. And the US government did not think that this was a terrorist attack. They know who the person is, but they have not proceeded with um, with prosecuting this person. This is just one example. In the midst of the pandemic, Cuba has paid for the hospitalization of all sick, of all patients, for the food. Cuba has paid for the quarantine period of those who were the COVID, suspected to be COVID positive. They have paid for the tests, for the PCR tests. And this process, just to give you an example, a crazy example, we've used 40 million pesos to pay a subsidy to Cuban artists who were not uh, who did not get, who were not getting a grant because we give special importance to, to to artists. There are so many things I could say about this, but I want to stick to the time allocated and have time to answer the questions that I'm sure will be asked afterwards by the young participants, by the audience and by other the young people and by other people who are listening to us online. So let me stop here so that I do not uh, use up all the time. I'd like to just emphasize once again, very enthusiastically, what we think, homeland or death, but we will always win. Okay, Enrique, thank you very much for your words. It is true that both in your case and in Carolis's case, we could be speaking for hours because trying to summarize this situation is close to impossible. 
We would like to ask you, Enrique, as we did with Carolis, that if you have your presentation in writing, that you send it over because we will try to also disseminate it in writing. We have some questions and we have time. We have 40 minutes. So we have 10 minutes for the conclusions and we'll have time to answer them. But here I'll be a bit more strict because I really want you to answer to the questions. And I'd like to ask you to be as brief as possible. I've clustered them in two groups. In the first uh, section is about specific questions about Cuba and Venezuela. And the second part of the second section are general questions. So let me begin with the specific questions to your countries. I'll ask Carolis one thing, and then I will ask two things. Um, and uh, then I will ask two or three very important questions to both of you. So please leave some time for the second uh, group of questions. Carolis, we have a question here. And I think this is very interesting, whether you could go into the details of the kind of aid that you have for families in Venezuela. And then Enrique, so that I don't have to ask again, take the floor again myself, I have two similar questions for you. First, if you think that the Communist Party in the US can be a way to normalize the relationships between the US and socialist countries, and also within the same framework, whether you think that Cuba, as it doesn't depend on multinationals, is that a strength or a weakness? So Carolis, you have the floor. And please, I have to warn you that the other questions are also quite deep. Greetings once again. Specifically, aid to families stem from the president, Nicolás Maduro. We have to uh, explain that the president has uh, issued over a thousand appeals for, to peace, and we say that peace starts at home. That's our motto. If the household, if the home is at peace, then we can build peace in our community, and therefore, continue and expand this to the rest of society and reach peace in general. And we know that one of the factors that contributes to peace is precisely protection of uncertainty of knowing that you're not alone. In that sense, Venezuela has created a system of missions that has allowed us to uh, organize 11 missions. For you to understand, a mission in our case is a specific protection policy for a specific sector, social sector, created by the Bolivarian Revolution, but that has facilitated moving forward against bureaucracy. That means the policy reaches uh, people through popular power, through uh, let's say easier mechanisms so that bureaucracy, the bureaucracy we have inherited, this bureaucratic elephant, eats up the aid. So the, the system of missions in a country has helped us protect the totality of the population. We know and we've measured that at least one mission and great mission uh, has touched a family in a country, a household, at least one. So we have to highlight in that regard, the so-called great mission, Hogares de la Patria, Homes of the Homeland, which is in the words of the president, is the mother of all missions, because this is the big mission through which we address the characterization of each family, of the reality of each family. And we can therefore consider the impact or define the policy that's needed for that household. 6.2 million families are covered by 
the mission Barrio Adentro Salud, Neighborhoods and Health, is one of the first missions created by the revolution with the support of the government and the, the Cuban government and the Cuban people. And we have the mission Vivienda Venezuela, Venezuela Housing. This is a, a big mission that has helped us deliver over 3.7 million houses to this number of families throughout the years that we have been in the revolution. I have to say as well that we've had educational missions. They have helped us eradicate illiteracy with the Robinson mission and with the ESI CAN program. It is based on a methodology also um, created by the Cuban Revolution. This is not just a completely free mission. It has also helped students move to secondary school and um, higher education to universities for most of the population. Now we've been thinking about fourth level uh, studies, completely free um, higher studies. So these missions have an impact on the population as a whole, because if a person does not get to study through one of these missions through the Ministry of Education and uh, the Ministry of Universities, we've started during the pandemic a new policy called each family a school, so that through uh, distance education, we can offer access to content to all Venezuelan families and the big uh, mission homes of the homeland, we've established supporting homes for those homes in which um, the parents have to go out for work and so that the children, if they are uh, alone, we've had women of mm, this big mission, homes of the homeland, and they make their homes available so that these children can get together to study and support them in their tasks. Likewise, we have the mission system and big mission system that is present throughout the territory. And with a movement called Somos Venezuela, we're Venezuela. These are young men and women who go to their homes to, to give the, they conduct home to household visits to see the impact of these missions. And one of these missions is the food mission. This is, this mission is entitled with the distribution of the grants of production committees and they have um, the bags that contain the basic basket food items for 5 million and uh, with uh, these 5 million bags every two weeks or weekly depending on the um, territory and we also have the agro venezuela mission to promote sowing and growing of different uh, foodstuffs and also animal husbandry initiatives that might help covering basic food needs. I don't want to go into more details, Maite, because we have around 30 missions and we have 11 big missions on top of that in which we have, uh, we're distributing our social support system in the country. But I have to say, in case I know that the forum is addressing young people, but in case we have um, other elderly or um, older people, we have a more major, there's a mission specifically targeting so-called old age um, citizens, elderly citizens. And thanks to that, um, we have 100% of the population as uh, who fulfill the requirements have received their pension. And I have to say that according to our constitution in Article 88, we've established that uh, housewives also belong to the working class and therefore they are also they also have social protection rights. In this sense, we guarantee that they get an old age pension and uh, for women, 
um, after 55 years of age and for men after 60 years of age, that this uh, pension includes workers who are not in the formal sector, that they're not working in the formal sector, or that in this case, they're working from home or in the homes. That's it from now, but I will send you information about the missions and big missions so that you can study it. And we will, we're happy to get proposals on how to improve this. Thank you very much, Enrique. Yes, first of all, just a brief uh, explanation about the normalization of relationships with the US. I think that the US as an imperial center do not have normal relationships with any country in the world and not with us in particular. I think that our relations, uh, the relationship is quite abnormal. It is trying to establish or just trying to intervene and change the government in the country so that they have a government that is subjected to the, to the imperial interests. I understand the question as it refers to how we can achieve or what segments of society or what kind of parties can be mediators in this process and trying to have better a better relationship between the US and socialist countries and not many of us left. Maybe Cuba is one of the few socialist countries left in the world. But I do not see anybody in particular doing this. I think that all voices are important and the embargo is not strictly ideological. This is not a human rights issue. There are many countries in the world uh, violate human rights uh, openly and blatantly with um, monarchies, etc. And the US government has, has historically supported and vehemently supported dictatorships in Latin America and uh, with Batista, Trujillo, Somoza, Pinochet, Videla. So when anybody else who comes up, or well, they have supported governments such as Bolsonaro, who has produced a small genocide in his country, such as Trump and his trying to imitate him with measures or anti-measures to protect the population of COVID-19. So in theory, they defend a particular understanding of the world and we defend a different one. That's how it might look on paper, right? But that's not the case. I think that every single voice will be welcome. It's not like we are saying that blockade is an ideological uh, issue is an economic issue that has by the way a correlate uh, that goes hand in hand with it which is ideological we live in an interdependent global world we don't have a socialist market in the world the market is geared by capitalist rules and i think there's a term a concept that's uh, very important here having cuba depending on what or on whom i, I think cuba needs foreign investment and the us are doing their best uh, to stop that happening But the main point here is the ability that our revolutionary state uh, has uh, to target investments uh, to those areas and sectors that are basic uh, for our people's well-being and uh, so that our people can be better protected through those investments. And uh, I'm talking about a socialist state that has the control of the country, that has the majority support from the population. And because of that, the connection uh, between the government and multinationals that might come or that are here, for instance, working in the tourist industry. Some of them are Spanish uh, multinationals. For instance, Melia uh, was sanctioned. I don't know if you're aware of that. Top management in 
Melia uh, are banned uh, from visiting uh, the United States. Uh, they can't do it, their families can't do it, they might not want to do it. But still, we have uh, that uh, the powers that be that imagine that happiness depends on us visiting the United States. And I can tell you my list of countries that I would like to visit uh, is very long. Uh, and, and the US is not particularly one of them. So it's an illegal, unacceptable uh, situation. Again, Melia is a multinational group that has uh, hotels here, partly owned by the Cuban government uh, because the land where the hotels have been built uh, is uh, Cuban. But I'm saying it very clearly. Uh, we don't have uh, sources for funding that are easy, shall we say, like crude oil, like uh, our dear comrades in Venezuela have, and even they are having problems because that's being blocked for them. What does Cuba have? Well, we have uh, the collective intelligence uh, drawn from all those different peoples, uh, not uh, distinguishing uh, ethnicity because 61 percent of uh, public officers are women that should be say said i'm talking to a group of women uh, that i appreciate very much and that's what we have in cuba uh, those are our resources and we do need uh, funding uh, from foreign sources definitely right I was saying earlier that uh, we ask you questions and they're not simple, right, to answer. And I understand that you would probably need longer uh, to address these questions. We've selected three more questions uh, for this second part of our Q&A session before we start with the conclusions for our meeting today. And these questions are very political in nature, not that the previous ones were not relevant, obviously. They were more specific and uh, they also have a lot of political relevance. Uh, but anyhow, these are more general uh, questions uh, talking about the US and the European Union. That's important, Stu. So I'm going to ask you all three questions uh, together and then I will hand the floor first to Carolis followed by then Enrique uh, with your answers. And after we listen to your answers, uh, we will see how much time we have for conclusions. So here come the questions. Could a change of presidency in the United States, the new American president reduce the blockade and sanctions against Venezuela and the blockade uh, in Cuba? That would be the first question. The second question is, why is it that the Uni European Union that has signed a cooperation agreement with Cuba, why is it that the European Union uh, doesn't have a clear uh, position against blockade? Well, as a chairperson, I will take advantage of my role and ask what is the European Union doing about uh, sanctions in Venezuela? I would add that little comment to that question. And then the third question, I think is a fantastic question uh, as uh, the cherry on the cake. What could be done or what can progressives in Europe do and progressives in the rest of the world do, so we can better help Venezuela and Cuba uh, fight the inhumane blockade imposed of your countries. What can we all do? So I think there are three great questions for this last part of our Q&A session. Carolis, the floor is all yours. Right. Having a new president 
in the United States. Is that going to modify the imperial policy against uh, our country? Do we have any expectations in that sense? I would say we have no hope for that. Why? Because we have experienced the imperial siege uh, since Commander Chavez became president. And during the whole time when our revolution was taking uh, clear steps towards socialism and against imperialism, the uh, attacks uh, were more and more obvious. The unilateral coercive measures I've been mentioning, which have in fact uh, turned into some parallel kind of government uh, led in our country by Mr. Juan Guaido, which, who, by the way, was acknowledged uh, by the American government uh, during Trump's president's presidency first, and now by Biden's uh, administration too. A country that has provided resources and uh, has had uh, meetings uh, with uh, this parallel government. So we think that uh, it doesn't really depend on who is leading the government in the US. I think the change uh, would require a new vision of the world. Enrique said it earlier. It's not just uh, the US, it's the rest of the world that has been arrogant and it has opened uh, all these spaces uh, to opposition in Venezuela with part of that uh, opposition uh, taking part in the previous elections. And as a result of that, uh, the uh, political forces in our country uh, were reshaped. We know that uh, the change in the uh, presidency of the American state, uh, the United States, hasn't uh, meant any changes uh, for the Venezuelan people and the Venezuelan revolution. And we have been witnessing that situation for over 22 years now. About the next question, what could the pro progressives do to help us? Well, I would like to invite you all to uh, organize ourselves uh, so that uh, the truth in Venezuela can be seen, so that the coercive unilateral measures and blockade uh, can be visible everywhere. In your case, in the European Union. My second uh, point uh, in this respect would be uh, having a uh, places uh, where we can all talk and explain uh, what we're like, what the country is like, because I'm here telling you a little bit about uh, what is happening in my role as a minister. But it would be really important uh, if we could have uh, meetings uh, where leaders of our popular movement with uh, leaders from youth organizations, from student organizations, so that you could hear their voices and uh, their explanation of uh, Bolivarian uh, revolution. I totally agree with Enrique. Blockade uh, is economic at heart, but when we talk about our situation and about the Cuban revolution, that amazing experience, or the Bolivarian uh, revolution. So we can explain our specificities and how we can build a new model that can respond uh, to uh, fundamental needs of the human race. So my invitation uh, would be for mutual help. We can also contribute uh, by telling you uh, how the European Union goes beyond the, your governments or your government's positions towards 
Bolivarian Revolution so that European Union citizens could know about our reality from our own voices. That's all. Thank you very much, Maite. Enrique? Well, I would say that there were people who thought uh, Biden would follow Obama's policies and there would be less hostility in uh, relationships, although I always say that uh, even during Obama's government, there were hostilities. He was less aggressive, that's true. And yet, uh, looking at what Biden's government is doing, uh, what we see is that they have uh, preserved every single measure that uh, had been taken against Cuba uh, during Trump's government. And I'm not uh, saying that will always be the case, but I, I have no confidence that they will change anything. Both uh, Che Guevara and uh, Castro uh, said uh, that we should give nothing uh, to imperialism and we know that imperialism is aggressive by definition. You know the story where the toad uh, is helping uh, the insect uh, cross the river but at the end of that wonderful trip, uh, the scorpion uh, bit the toad and uh, stung the toad and killed it. And uh, the toad asked, why did you do that? Well, it's my nature. And that's the case. Imperialism is by definition about exerting force, uh, economic force on other peoples. and that has a very negative impact in our countries uh, because we have alternative models that, as Caroli said, uh, demonstrate uh, that a change is possible. And why is it that Europe is not doing more towards Cuba? Well, I personally disagree. I think there are many uh, European citizens that do a lot for Cuba and uh, that mention our countries uh, as an example to follow. And for those of us uh, who have suffered the pandemic, that is all of us, for those of us who followed what has been happening in the world uh, for almost two years now, I must say that uh, it's become more obvious than ever before that uh, the world is united, that we are all one that uh, if something happens in a country uh, many, many miles away from me here, it has an impact on me. What happens in Europe uh, has an impact on Latin America and the other way around. I think it's basic for us all to come to that understanding, to accept that uh, so that we can better face the post-pandemic world for us to also be responsible and accountable uh, for us to understand that neoliberalism and capitalism is responsible uh, for the deterioration of the healthcare systems, for social benefits, for uh, pushing all those uh, responsibilities uh, into the private fear more and more because if we don't do that how on earth are we, are we going to face the uh, environmental crisis how are we going to join forces uh, to help women or to favor the L lgtbi movement uh, or uh, help in uh, to stop climate change and younger generations or those who are deprived in the world and when we uh, cubans the brigade uh, was in turin in italy that was crystal clear uh, we could see it and uh, italians could see it and we could see how many italians uh, are very full of solidarity towards cuba so why is it that we're not as united as we should 
well, you know that there are vested interests, some uh, partnerships and agreements uh, with the United States. And it's a great shame because the European Union could and should be much more independent uh, from the model set by the European governments. I think that's what uh, European governments and countries should think about. I still think that uh, a lot of progress has been made in Europe, and I would just uh, encourage for that progress to continue. What could progressives in Europe and the world do uh, to better help us here? Well, more uh, dissemination of the truth of what we have here raise awareness and lobby their governments, making uh, companies accountable uh, for their participation in the blockade and also lobby, try to lobby the, um, the, the government and civil society in the United States. That dialogue has to be established. Uh, may I have just one extra minute, Maite? Oh yeah, one, two, three minutes, whatever you need. Thank you so much, because I would like to explain a little bit something that I just glossed over earlier on. I just mentioned it, but I would like to go back to the uh, uh, Henry Reeve contingent. The medical uh, international movement in Cuba goes back to 1962. That means it has always been part of the Cuban revolution, always there year after year. But since the Katrina hurricane uh, hit New Orleans in the United States uh, with terrible impact uh, on a lot of Afro-American people living in the area. Well, at that time, uh, Cuba, uh, got together uh, this fantastic team of doctors and nurses, which we can do uh, because we have uh, over 50,000 uh, doctors uh, who are trained, not just in medicine, but also in other principles of solidarity. So they set up a team uh, who wanted to go uh, to New Orleans uh, to help the American people. And in fact, a lot of uh, poor American students are studying medicine uh, for free in Havana, by the way. So that was the time when a group, a con contingent, uh, was set up uh, that would be called upon for uh, natural disasters, uh, catastrophes, uh, medical crisis, and uh, the name that was given to that group, that con contingent, was uh, Henry Reeve, who was uh, an American general who came to Cuba, who joined uh, the uh, pro-independence forces fighting uh, Spain at the time, and from uh, a soldier, he became a general. So he's a Cuban hero uh, who was born in the States. That's why we uh, gave that name to that group, medical group that was going to help in the United States. Well, uh, that was the idea, but uh, the government in the United States uh, didn't allow uh, that group uh, to uh, go and help. But soon after that, uh, other situations arose and uh, the group went to Guatemala, uh, which didn't have uh, diplomatic relationships with Cuba, by the way. Fortunately, that has changed since then. And the group also went to Pakistan. And I'm just mentioning this because political issues has never have, have never uh, been a barrier for a medical brigade uh, to go and aid wherever it was needed. So that was the beginning of this uh, story, which is a myth, I say. Uh, a myth uh, because of all the lives uh, they have managed to save and, and help. For instance, during the Ebola 
crisis, uh, the Henry Reeves uh, group uh, was in Africa in three different countries in Western Africa. And now with the COVID pandemic, I don't know if I told you, uh, it was 57 brigades uh, that uh, went and helped 40 countries around the world, uh, 20 of them in Latin America and the Caribbean. At that time, 28,000 of our professionals were already working uh, in 22 different countries as well. Healthcare providers. That's why we have a campaign uh, to give the Henry Reeves uh, contingent uh, the Nobel Peace for Prize. Prize for peace, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for going back to that, Enrique. It's, it's really important, right? Because we've all heard of the Henry Gree Reeves Brigade. And we have all these labels and concepts. Uh, we talk about blockades or sanctions, and, and we sometimes don't realize how far they go. The Transform Foundation and the European left uh, that have joined forces to organize this seminar with the super important help of the young wing of the European left party. Well, I can tell you that we were so excited what we heard when we heard about this petition, this campaign uh, for the brigades, uh, the Henry Reeves Br Brigade uh, to run for the Nobel Peace. And uh, now, as a way of conclusion, uh, I think it's important for me to try and summarize uh, what we will then, well, we're recording the session, so we will go over uh, everything that was said to make sure our conclusions are right. And we will disseminate uh, the recording as much as we possibly can, uh, because it's really well worth it for everybody to hear what you're saying. And I'm getting messages on my mobile phone congratulating us uh, all the time uh, during the seminar. Let me just uh, summarize. Caroli said uh, how basic uh, disseminating what is actually happening, how important it is for people to know what is happening in your countries. My second conclusion is that we should work to promote uh, more and better uh, opportunities for us to uh, continue to talk. Dear Carolis, Enrique, dear young generations, uh, we have to do it, it's true, and then we will have to find ways to do it right for us to continue to talk about these issues. And uh, the youth is fundamental in our meeting today, uh, but also let me add women. Women are really important. We unfortunately uh, have a very different uh, reality in Venezuela or in Cuba from the situation we have in 95% of European countries, maybe not 100%, really, really, it might be 100%, but it's a little bit embarrassing saying that it's everywhere. The way gender and women are, uh, treated i am really familiar with how uh, women are treated uh, in women and i'm very much aware that we're still light years uh, behind you so uh, let's do our best uh, now that we have these wonderful online remote seminars and meetings uh, one of the benefits uh, after the pandemic. It makes it a lot cheaper, right, for us to meet and talk. Uh, we don't need uh, to cover travel expenses. Uh, so let's keep that uh, debate open as much as we could. You've also both mentioned how very different it is uh, in your alternative models. The Cuban model uh, is long-standing socialism on the one hand in Venezuela, there is still a large part of the country that's in the hands of uh, capitalists. It's a left-wing government uh, in a country uh, where the economy uh, is uh, 
quite different, right, uh, from the case in Cuba. And yet the situation here in Europe uh, is very difficult. Uh, well, you, I'm sure you know uh, about the recent relations in France uh, where the results were not terrible, but not great. You know what happened in Hungary with uh, the LGTBI uh, issue and the Hungarian president there. That there are so many different uh, issues and scenarios that uh, need uh, looking after in Europe. Uh, the far right in Europe, the slogans like freedom or communism, right? Uh, where you're supposed to choose between those two. And I think that a meeting like ours today, as Enrique said, uh, are great opportunities uh, for us to talk about internationalism and cooperation. And we can't stop at words, uh, just like you uh, prove every day in Cuba. Venezuela is doing what they can in their difficult situation. But uh, international solidarity, uh, there's no doubt, is now more important than ever before. I think the pandemic has uncovered a lot of uh, cans of worms. You know, uh, the story of uh, the uh, king uh, who was walking in the nude and we have situations about countries which are supposedly developed countries uh, where public services are in shambles. Uh, there's so much for us to do, even in countries uh, where that progress uh, had been made in the past. We've lost uh, ground. So because of that, uh, we will obviously continue to organize organizations like ours here today and tomorrow, and uh, we need to keep thinking uh, how we can better contribute political parties, trade unions, social movements all over the world so that uh, we can work hand in hand looking at the uh, journey that the capitalist has set, uh, the roadmark, uh, road, the roadmap is very clear for them. So uh, we have to be clear as well, us uh, in the left and join forces in everything we possibly can. We've only got eight minutes left. What is your message? Um, let's hear first from Enrique, if you agree. And then we will finish with Carolis. Enrique, you have three minutes. Can you give us a positive message, if possible, for Europe? And then four minutes for Carol is, uh, how can we better prioritize uh, the gender uh, mainstreaming? Now, that's a joke, right? Thank you both very much, yeah? Thank you. I was very, I'm very pleased to have been here in the company of these two extraordinary women. What message can I send to the European people? I know many Spaniards, I know many uh, French citizens, Italians, the citizens of Belgium, uh, whose life meaning is solidarity. I've seen with time how young people have grown up in those countries to, who have also grown aware of their capacity to change things and strive for a better world. I think that the understanding of our situation has also grown, understanding that only through a real integration, not an integration of corporations, of finance, but an integration of the peoples can be the uh, entry point for a better life, for a fuller life for all human beings. And I think that Europe today plays a key role in the world. 
No, because we go back to a, a Eurocentric um, vision and think that the world starts in Europe and the rest is irrelevant. But because, in fact, Europe is a continent that has an important economic and social development level that might push the development of a true human relationships across the world and between peoples. I think that Cubans, and I think Venezuelans as well, expect from Europeans, and this might be a bit abstract when we speak about the Europeans, I'm sure you all feel part of that joint history that you all have, but we hope that Europeans get back more and more to humanism and to the humanism that was that stemmed from the French Revolution, humanism that has to do with the history, with the heroic history of Spaniards, the humanism that has to feel and be present in the activities of all of you. If that is the case, I'm sure humanity will make progress. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to those who are no doubt the future of Europe already. So we have the Siglo de las Luces by Alejo Carpentier. It's a reference text. Carolis, you have the floor now. Well, first of all, I feel truly honored to have shared the space. We would like to convey our greetings to all the colleagues who participated, all the comrades who participated. And as Enrique was saying, in these new times, in these new struggles that humankind is facing and in the horizon ahead of us for a post-pandemic society, we are all there to become those who have been traditionally been invisible have to become the mode of the engine behind transformation, the transformation of not just our immediate reality in our countries, but the engine to transform the world as at large and humanity at large. That's why I would invite you all to understand as we have in our continent um, to take Che and Fidel and Chavez as our examples. And if you go back to your own roots, you will find the blood of heroes and heroines who believed in a different world. And we have to raise, we have to hoist the flag of socialism. And we should also build a different reality because until now, what Oliver would say is just a prelude to what is about to, what is to be done. For us women and for us young women, this challenge fills us with strength and fills us with the energy that is renewed every day as we walk hand in hand with other men and women who have transcended to, with men and women who are a bit older than us and with the men and women who are rising against this model and for our model, which is not just possible, but it can be constructed and perfected as long as we decolonize and depatriarchalize our mind. I'm sure dear comrades listening to us that as Bolivar said, the most perfect system is the one trying to achieve the biggest accumulation of happiness possible. And it is there in happiness and in love where the strongest point of society lays and this why when we find hatred and uh, misery that is pushed by the imperial model forces us to take upon the role that history has for us. We need to make progress fearlessly because this is not just possible, this is a historical demand that we get together, that we get organized and that we focus on concrete aspects and that we strengthen those bonds to decrease inequality and that we strengthen our bonds so that we find emancipated women and happy women who walks hand in hand with men such as Enrique 
writing history and being the protagonist of history, Chavez said that in 2009, when he said that this revolution was a feminist revolution. And he said that we had to write our own concepts and that's what we're doing. We're writing the epistemology of the South without any kind of ego and inviting you to write from this new Europe your own concepts. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Greetings, warm greetings from the president of the European Left Party, Heinz Birnbaum. To both speakers, I'd like to thank the interpreters as well. I'd like to thank the technical support team and thank you so much to everybody who's been listening to us and who will be listening to us after the seminar because the questions were very important for our discussion. So see you in the struggle. See you soon, dear comrades. See you soon.